All right, so let's start. Um, today we're doing continuous traits and tree stretching. Okay, so this is stuff that the core of my research is around this area, but not all of it. Okay, so here you see a little simulation of a continuous <laughs> trait evolving under what we call an Ornstein Ullenbeck process. Um, it's being pulled toward the human body. So as you see, it gets pulled quickly at first, and then there's nothing here that gets pulled less, less strong. All right, first of all, uh, the beast analysis, how do those go? You were running. <laughs> yeah, I heard someone got an ESS of four or some things. Others? Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be that hard to install. <laughs> Others? Well, I mean, the... Yeah, it could be a Mac for two season, but they should have been both been 2.1.3, I think. It could be a Mac PC thing. You have a Mac at home, though. Yeah. I'll buy you. Um, okay. One thing to think about also is, like, those of you who worked through it, you saw, like, there was a nice little friendly GUI for making the XML file, and then to go and edit it manually. Right? And so, in phylogenetics, a lot of times you have to go in and fix things manually, even if it feels like it has a nice GUI, like, like Mesquite, for example. Mesquite adds things to files that other programs should be able to deal with, but they can't. They use a different sort of version of the spec. And so you have to be able to know, like, oh, I have to go ahead and delete the title block because Mr. Basil just throw up his hands if it sees a title block. Yeah. So I'm for with that computer lingo. What is it you mean? Oh, GUI. Sorry. Graphical user interface. So, so it has menus and stuff like that versus a command line interface that's just the beauty of text. All right, so, you know, I can get around my computer by, you know, uh, finding a cursor somewhere, you know, and a window and, you know, Dropbox and whatever, right? Or I could use command line interface. Looks over here. You know, and I can easily, you know, remember how old my kids are because I forget that. And then, you know, go to the desktop. See what's there. You open things up. So a command line interface. Yeah. Yeah. So with phylogenetics, you don't necessarily need to use a command line interface for things, but you need to be able to like go into the raw file and just look at it. So have like Notepad or Text Wrangler or Text Edit. So you just edit raw text and just mess with it there. Okay. Um, a lot of things now, though, are being done in R. So once you're in the R environment, you just hang out in R and do things there. Where it sort of sometimes has a feeling of a GUI, but it's mostly command line stuff, right? which makes it reproducible. You can say, you know, load tree, plot tree, um, make it a PDF and save it. And that will work the same way each time. You don't remember, oh, where'd that PDF button go? Let's be repeatable. OK. Other sort of questions about Beast? Questions about priors. Okay. Well, I guess one question. Yeah. <laughs> we almost made it past. <laughs> no, questions are good. That's why we had the class. Um, so maybe this is for a separate time. But I was a little bit confused as to why we were setting a different distribution for all the different is it just to like to show you, like give an example of each of the different ways? Yeah, for the exercise, just to show you, like, oh, you can have a log normal, oh, you can have a uniform. That's my figure, but I didn't yeah. want to take that assumption away, and then it was actually, well, no, this is done for this reason, because this is how it should be done. I mean, it, it, you can change priors based on your, what your information is, right? So if all I know is that 
I have some fossil from sometime here to here, and that's it, then maybe you want to use a uniform. If I say, I know the fossil is here, but maybe the group's a little older than the fossil, maybe when I have a uh, log normal. Yeah. Other questions? Do people use density at all? Okay, what was density like? With the sample trees they gave us. Right. So Bayesian approaches give you back not a single tree, right? They give you a, a posterior probability, a posterior distribution of trees that you want to summarize in some way. And so one way of doing that is plotting the trees on top of each other, right? And if all the trees are the same height, right, then every time I plot them, they'll just overplot, right? But if some of them are a little shallower because of you know you have uncertainty in the age node ages, you might have it like that, and then something like that. And so you can see this cloud of trees, you know what the, what the overall summary is. That's what density can do. And so a separate program for that, but you can also you know write your own. So at one point I was working with someone, I couldn't remember the name of the pro name of that program, so I just rewrote it in R. It was easier than like, trying to figure out what it was. Um, <laughs> Google. Yeah, I, but like tree, and there's there's, hunt, there's dozens of tree plotting programs, right? So I need to hit us plot man. Yeah. And after this class, you know how to do that. It's great. Um, other questions? Okay. So in the past, we've done reading trees um, and how to look at a tree and understand what it means. The nearest time Markov chain with finite state space. Parsimony Bayes likelihood, tree inference support, and gang tree some data. And today I want to tell you about continuous models, stretching models, and an uh, we'll get have time for an application of this later. Okay. So first go to the website for the course, brownamera.info, and get the, the source code for R and try running it. What? And so here's the code. Now most of this code is just make it look pretty. Alright, so we want you to. So, who can explain what the code is doing, first of all? Also, it's erasing your hard drives, and you shouldn't use random without checking. <laughs> Um, it's making a graph. Graph of what? Well, the core function is this R fund. What is this doing?
Yep. Exactly. So take me mean. Instead of the plots. Something like this. And so here's a single drop and exponential. Right? What does it look like? How would you describe that period? <coughs> yeah. Right, because you know too much, right? It looks as, like an exponential curve, right? It looks like an integral follow up curve, right? Look at the normal distribution? No. Okay. And you see here, if you do one draw, I get this green line, that's not a non normal distribution. Right? But when we get to a thousand draws, it creates a similar to normal distribution. Right? I'll start breaking it. Alright? So. If I made something special about exponential, let's try doing a log normal. Yeah. Still, you know, weird earlier and then it gets to be a normal distribution again. Let's try uniform. Again, look what's happening here. Try uniform distribution. And if you do one value, get this line. If I do five of the orange line, and you do ten values, and this curve, and if you do this curve, and the thousand that curve. So what's happening here? Right, so the means are converging to normal. Right? The means are normally distributed. They don't, does this remind anyone of, any, of anything? Central limit theorem. Or stepmother. Yeah. What, what, what's central limit theorem? Mm -hmm. Right. And so this is actually showing that empirically. So, like, okay, so you've heard that in every stats class you've taken, right? These let you let you test that, right? And say, okay, yeah, sure, I believe you, buddy. But you know, let's try doing, you know, that plus our norm n plus you know five times um, yeah, our exp n. And again, you know, the first one's kind of weird, but after you have enough of them, take the average of them, get to normal. Okay? And so, <coughs> and you mess with some more um, at home. Okay? But you see the basic idea. So we're adding a bunch of things under some distribution. No matter how crazy the distribution, so there's just some very minor limits we'll talk about in a minute. You know, adding a bunch of them together and dividing, which you don't have to do, gives you this normal distribution. Okay. So, <coughs> central limit theorem. Right. So here is the central limit theorem. So a sum of a set of independent and identically distributed random vari vari variates 
that come from an arbitrary population distribution function with finite mean and variance approaches the normal distribution. Okay, so let's unpack this a bit. Okay. Independent and uniquely distributed. IID, you say it. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when so picks don't depend on other picks, what else does it mean? Mm -hmm. right, it's the same thing as you're pulling from each time. Okay. But it's not such that, you know, if I, put, if, I imagine, if I have a bunch of, you know, candy and uh, Hershey, Hershey candies or something, right? If I pick out, pick out all the crackles, Right? There's no more crackles there, it's not independent. Now I can't pull out any more. Right? But I, each time I open a new bag and, open, and pull one out. Same distribution, presumably, across the factory, and each pull is independent. So, for example, that applies to random Well, like, so. Okay. Okay. Random variates. What does that mean? Just the numbers you're pulling. Right. So say okay. Right. Yeah. So just like you know, a set of like. Okay, have a normal, pull a number from a normal. Put another normal, normal. There's a random variance. Okay. <coughs> okay. Arbitrary probability distribution function. What does that mean? Yep. Pick a function, almost any function. Right? Arbitrary. Okay. Asterisk. Except for it has to have a finite mean variance. Okay. Um, most distributions have that, right? Like Cauchy does not. Something I don't come across. Right? But uniform, exponential, Poisson, binomial, all these have a finite mean variance. Right. Some of them have a finite mean variance. Right. Um, mixtures of them. So if I say, you know, pull random, pull uniform number. If it's greater than 0.5, pull a normal. Give me that. If it's, greater, if it's less than 0.05, call, call, pull from exponential. Give me that. Right? That sort of weird function, that's the, that's, that function still matches you know, having a finite mean variance. Okay. Approach to the normal distribution. Okay. So that's the sum. We did, we did the mean, not the sum. Is that a problem? What? Right. Yeah, mean is just sum divided by number of samples. Right. It's just, we're just scaling that. We're stretching it on the x-axis. It's still a normal distribution. Okay. Why is this awesome? You know, to expect how? Mm -hmm. Right. So you can say, okay, imagine I have, you know, adding up a whole bunch of random things. Right? Um, <coughs> with many, many factors playing a role in it. Right? I don't know what they are. But if I can assume some basic conditions of, you know, independent and distributed, and finite mean and variance, and add it all up, up for the normal distribution. Okay. And then I can have various ways to use the normal efficiently. So look at weights of evolution, look at population distributions, things like that. Okay. This lets me do a lot of cool models um, without having to specify a lot of what goes into them in terms of you know, drift versus selection versus mutation. Um, 
So again, here's what we're doing, right? We're just taking you know, mean of a bunch of numbers from some distribution. Right? And then just plot this you know, for <coughs> um, can I do, do the sum here, just plot that sum, or do the mean? And get this same plot we were just looking at. This again shows how robust things are, right? So I can throw in these crazy little crazy functions and still get a normal out if I have enough things together. All right? So over evolutionary time, what happens? Well, let's say my evolution here goes into my body size, right? And very time, forward. And so at this point, something changes, right? I have a new optimum pushing over here. And boom, I move there. And now I have, you know, drift changing the population size, changing changing body size. Okay. And I'm over here, okay, and so forth. So I have a bunch of random displacements for the time. Okay, maybe they're exponentially distributed, maybe they're normally distributed, maybe they're uniformly distributed. Who cares? Right? Why? They go to the normal, right? So some of them will be normally distributed, right? And so if I were to rerun this simulation many times, I could see, you know, we might end up end up here some here some time, 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 here some time. You know, plot that density, it'd be a normal distribution. Okay. Everybody started, you know, took <coughs> all birds present at the KT boundary, right? And just said, okay, let them evolve. And have them, you know, gain or lose body size every million years. What if I could see? I could see each bird centered on variable value with normal distribution. Okay. So this gives a central limit theorem for evolution. You say, okay, we don't care really what, what the different processes are. We still get the same pattern out and the same model we can fit. Okay. Ah. Good question, right? So body size. There are very few birds with negative body sizes. Right? So how do you deal with that? Give me ideas. We just do the same thing we do when we're thinking about things that add, combine multiplicative with. So, if I were to say, you know, so, so something like body size, do I think it says, do I think it's even lucky for an elephant and a mouse to lose a kilogram in body mass? No. What? I think a log transform. I could say, I think it's even lucky for them to each go up or down by 10%. Right? And so, that's equivalent to saying, I think in a log space, their mass should evolve in a gravity motion way. And so, in cases where we have like a minimum boundary like zero, or something where we think it increased by percentage each generation rather than as a fixed, you know, me measure, then you often transform the log transformer data first. Okay, so rather than body mass, you do log body mass. Rather than height, you log height. Okay, and that way it sort of naturally bounds it to zero, but I can still go arbitrarily small or arbitrarily big. And then we do we have a, a minimum value bound. We have a maximum value, yeah, that's a problem. Um, and so, you can imagine cases like that where, you know, land mammals only get so big right, because it doesn't work well scaling wise, right? And then they have bone and, and lung and nothing else, right? <coughs> and so, you can imagine some sort of fixed boundary there. Um, you can sort of get that with forward in time simulation models in terms of like the nice simple models like this. Yet. Okay. And so who recognizes this? PDF, yep. Of a normal. Right. So for this, you know, given value here, I'll select you that value with a plug and chuck. Right. So I can put in that number here, you know, plug two in here, give it a mean, put in variance. 
your values you can meet again, right? Drag it here, in the equation, up comes left. Okay. In R, you do, you do it this way. And so for a single branch that starts off in value u and ends up in value x and has as much constant as amount of rate, rate of change, I can use that equation. I want to do the whole tree. Right, so I could do one part I could do, like we're doing the tree case, is do let you go from here to here, here to here. Here, 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 we now have a vector of observations and vector of means. And instead of a single variance here, now I have a covariance matrix. Any questions about that? You're looking at observation of the tips. This word is 5 kilograms, this word is 20 kilograms, this word is 1 kilograms. And so those are values for the observation of the tips. Where do I get my mu? So it's basically the phylogenetic that you weighted me, right? Um, or I could just more simply even just optimize it. Right? And there's ways to calculate it directly. So I could say, okay, what's length would it be in zero? It would be 0.1, or 0.1. Um, and you can find the, that value that maximizes it. Okay. And we have close, closed form solutions for that, but even we didn't have it, just optimize normally. Okay. Other questions about this? Right. So this covariance matrix thing is just this. Oh, that's all. Yeah. What is, what is um, <coughs> so the covariance represents the amount of shared history in a tree which between two taxa. Right. So between A and B, what do they share? Red lines. Yep. This one and this one. Right. So <coughs> that time times the variance is their covariance, right? So the times the per unit per unit time rate. Rate plus time, and that's the variance. Okay. And this model variance is using it's linearly with time. Um, those covariance. And the variance is just that to do with itself. This is just, you know, this time. Really okay, so that's Brownian motion on a tree. Okay. Why is it called Brownian motion? It does white noise, of course. It's true, but that's not the right reason. So early microscopist named Brown was watching pollen grains in water. So they've had bad pollen grains, right? And they were moving around. Why may a pollen grain move in water? Mm 
into it, and so forth, getting bumped around, bumped around, bumped around, bumped around. Okay? And so after a while, <coughs> where, where, where do you expect it to move? Nowhere. So you expect, you expect it to be exact, in exactly the same place? Anyone disagree? Or agree? What? Keep moving. Okay? What do we'll think? So, it's so like the average or the combination of your two ideas, right? That on average, it's going to be exactly here, right? But that's going to be, if I, if I come back a short time later, you know, many of going to be being somewhere in here, a longer time, many of going to be somewhere here, a longer time, many of going to be somewhere here, right? If I could look at that, you are probably in some function you know, in one dimension, so it slides this way, right? After some time, it's here. After more time, it's there. After more time, it's there. Right? You get this normal distribution shape. Okay. Um, <coughs> is it sort of attracted to the central point? This is where it started, right? So you know, if I'm standing here and what's oh, so uh, better example, so a mosh pit, right? Um, I had students who went to a mosh. Uh, what was it? How many death metal? Melodic death metal. Um, and so they're in the mosh pit there, getting bumped around, right? They tend to be, they can be pushed various ways, right? But they tend to be centered on where they were. They're not, not trying to get back there. It happens to be, you know, I'm going to move this way, I'm going to move this way. Okay. <coughs> and so that's sort of brownie, this brownie motion. And so species can do that through time as well as through space. Okay. And so that's what. This idea is brownie motion. <coughs> oh, so this process that leads to multivariate normal distribution, that process of moving up a tree is called brownie motion. Okay. It is the simplest form. And of course, being phylogenesis, we add little tweaks to the models and call them new things and feel very proud of ourselves. Let's talk about this arm in a sec. Yeah. Alright, so any questions about that? So, with Brown motion, you assume it's not being pulled, it's still fluctuating. Right. Now, we can imagine, you know, some of the elaborations we could do, we can imagine there's some sort of pull. It's being juggled around, but being pushed downhill on average. And then it's not completely Brown motion anymore. Still multivariate normal um, under many formulations, but not Brown motion. Let's get to what those are in a minute. Mm -hmm. Or whatever trait you're looking at. Now I have two species here. Um, and so each one starts here as, as its origin point. Right, so now it's new me. Again, for species one, right? It ends up there. And then here's species two. Right, I wasn't trying to get them to you know, move apart. Actually, it's like I had them cross a few times. Right? It shouldn't happen. Well, no, they didn't get stuck together. Yeah. Um, and under all models, actually, once they speciate, they don't see each other again. Right? So you can imagine character displacement happening. And so if you're a small beak one, I'd be a big beak one. Not in this world. 
In this world, once you're speciated, you know, we don't see each other again, doesn't matter what other things are. Okay? Which, if speciation is allopatric, okay, maybe it's okay. We don't see each other for a while. Um, <coughs> maybe the time you do see each other again, there's just another random input, right? Along with various other things that we've been moving around, too. Okay. <coughs> and so, you know, see, they're identical up to this point, they speciate, and after that, you know, for a while they start to diverge. Make sense? Okay. Um, one thing to note here is this mean vector and a crucial ground in motion, right? So what's the expectation for A? What's the whatever it was here? Which is B, whatever it was here, C, whatever it was here, for B, whatever it was here, for B, whatever it was there. Right. Same same expectation for A. So a vector where U A is mu B. However, we're going to talk about some models in a minute, but that might not be the case. Okay. When that's the case, then we would plug in the different numbers here by the same number. Any questions about that? Okay. So, the way to think about how this would happen in a more general case. It's about how ch how a character can change a continuous instant, in an instant of time. Okay. In straight change in a single instant of time, right? So it could increase or decrease slightly by chance, right? or it could change directionally. Right? We pull towards some value. We're talking about. Right? And in math speak, you could call it. You could say, you know, dxt in instant of time right? equals a random wiggle, right? So a Wiener process, not just as a normal distribution, pull from normal distribution as a funny name. Okay. Imagine that. Maybe you want to scale it in some way. Have a scaling parameter for that. Slap that in. With the, the sort of the rate of the wiggle. Okay. And you also have a pull towards some value. Call that value being pulled towards theta. Right. And then we can have the entire difference right. um, right. Will that work for us? Go to okay. right. And then have the entire difference, and maybe want to add, you know, less than 100%. Because right, it gets the entire weight in one little tiny increment, you want to pull that. Okay. <coughs> and so this process is called the Ornstein Ullenbeck process. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, the, so it's all Greek to us, right? So beta, alpha, sigma. What? It represents the sum value, the optimal value. Okay. So if theta is 5 and x is 6, right, what's our, what's our displacement for this number? Negative 1, right? So we pull towards 5 through 6. So we're 4 here, we pull up. Okay. And so the way to think about it is you know, a little kid on a rope, or one of those elastic leashes you see in the mall. Right? And the kid definitely has a little brownie motion, a little bit more weird process getting around and into its leash, right? But it's still being pulled back to this optimal theta. Okay, and the more he pulls away, the more he's pulled back. Okay? But he's not, all, he's not always at this point, you know, around. Right? And jiggle. In some kids, you can be candy, and the jiggle perimeter goes up, moves around faster, right? <coughs> the turn can be forward, increasing alpha, and pulling back more. Okay, I could <coughs> cut the core completely with alpha zero. Then what happens? Just random just burning motion again, right? So I set it to alpha zero, then just burning motion. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yep, right. 
which, you know, we often like to put it into, like, you know, adaptive landscape envisioning and things like that. But it could be, you know, it's going towards some sort of mutational meltdown. Right? It's being pulled towards having nothing work at all, right? Um, and so the pull isn't towards some adaptive peak, but just sort of the way it's moving is it's going to hell, right? Because all the genes are breaking because it's a small population size or something. That could be a process that's an anti Nuremberg process. Right? Yeah. Brownian motion? Yeah, Brownian motion is a restriction. If you make alpha zero, it's Brownian motion. If alpha is not zero, something else will work in the process. Which, you kind of think the um, Brownian motion is a, a, um, a model. Um, though there's some actually, we're having some fights now, five minutes about whether we should include that or not. And technically, we can spell the root state. You know, that's here. But basically, it's in the nested. Mm -hmm. Or has some sort of. So if I start it off, you know, here's my you know, smiley face I'm starting off, and here's my optimal over here, then we need to pull this way. Right? But if I start it off and my fade is here, I still have some random wiggles, right? It's being pulled back towards this way all the time. And it's going to get too far away. Do you have examples of data of you know processes that are in nature? What? Selection. Uh, what kind of selection? Yeah. It's so like directional selection or stabilizing selection, right? Directional could be data out here, stabilizing could be selection data here. Right? Okay. So these are lots of cases where this could be relevant. Okay, um, and of course, you could imagine this occurring over an entire history of organisms, right? So maybe all of the plants have some pull towards some of the value. Right? That's where you're listening to you? No, why not? Okay, okay, what are you going to say? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, too bad. That's the model we have. No, not really. So we've made changes to it. All right. So we can imagine this general case, right, where the parameters change over parts of the tree. Right? So here, so I'll have one set of parameters, and, you know, index one, right? You can imagine here a different set of parameters in that blue part. Maybe here, another set of parameters, an orange part, and so forth. Right? And that would be the most general model. Okay. Should we try to fit that? Yeah. Well, you're inscrutable anyway. This won't help you. <laughs> What could be wrong with trying to fit a model, a model that's complex? All right, even, let's just take those three calls I have now. How many parameters in that model? How many parameters? No, it's just a little instant time. Well, let's have something to have this mapped on precisely. Yeah. Well, right, so. Wait, no, but is there 12? Is that how many there are in this case? Because there's four. If it's in a black of the region, yes. Right? Because each color here has its own theta, its own alpha, and its own sigma. So it's three for color. Right? The red ones, the blue ones, the orange ones, and the black ones. Yeah. Okay. So that would be four parameters. How much data do I have? Five. five. I have five data points, right? I typically have like, you know, body size of this one, body size of that 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 one. Right? So 12 parameters, five data points. What could go wrong? 
Yeah, we just don't have enough power to fit that much. Okay. <coughs> so you might want to have a way of simplifying the model. Okay. All right. 16. Now I could add more taxa, fit it. If they might want to have more parameters. I could add more characters. Right? Then I'd assume like body size and height are the same parameters. Probably not. Right? <coughs> okay. So then we want to have ways of restricting this to be simpler. Okay. And so history of the field is one of going from a very simple model to a more complex model. Okay. Um, so this general model. You know, people generally stay away from. Right? We have all these things across all the branches. All right, single rate running motion, right? Where sigma are all equal across the entire tree. Alpha is zero across the entire tree. Beta doesn't matter. I'm not being pulled towards anything. I don't, there's no strength of elastic. Where do I attach my elastic? Right? <coughs> and this single model here can be used a lot of the time. We're going to talk about doing independent contrast later on. We'll talk about using this model. And essentially, in construction, we use this model. Um, and one nice thing is because of the central limit theorem, if I'm assuming these changes up the tree are independent and evenly distributed, right, eventually it will become a Brownian motion model. Okay. Even if I have those colors on the tree, you know, these colors changing randomly. Eventually, that will become a writing motion model. If you have, if, if based on the color model, the colors changing with different betas and alphas, they'll eventually become writing motion. Right, so writing motion is really cool and powerful. So you end up there eventually. Okay. <coughs> well, that's true. So, early on, the that prophecies had one sigma across the entire tree, right? um, one alpha, but could be non zero, and we've got some pole. And then, you know, one to many thetas. So you could say, okay, what model fits best? One that has, you know, three different body, like optimal va values for a nullless body, or one? That's the body length. Oh, wow, there's, if it's best, we have, you know, five different optimal body lengths, you know, trunk crown one, twig grass one, so forth. You guys can find uh, support for that. Okay? So that's a little bit. Now, also, uh, the of them were converged from science. So two papers came out with the same model in the same, same year, independently of each other. Okay. So it could have been like someone was talking to both of us or something. But <coughs> they have a model where you have sigma varying over the tree, right? no alpha, no theta. Okay. And there's models, that's based on the model of allowing rate of evolution to change over time. Right? So we talked about how you know grasses and trees, uh, Herbs and herbs and trees have different rates of evolution. We can have that fit by a model like that. Okay. We can say I have something that I think is you know very specialized and can only have one sort of morphology. It doesn't go nuts. We might fit that by having you know a slow rate one part of the tree and a fast rate elsewhere. Okay. You should do that by allowing the ground. Mm -hmm. Right. A different way to do that would be to. Um, have the alpha change, right? And have the same sigma. Yeah, yeah. And have the same theta. Yep. And actually, um, some in s with some cases, it's it's going to be hard to distinguish a change in alpha versus a change in sigma, right? Because both allow you to vary more. They're technically identifiable, so if you have enough data, you can pick them apart. Right? In practice, you know, the, if you look at the likelihood of We want to have is in an ideal world, here would be sigma, here would be alpha. And we want to see, like, you know, might have some likely point is here and then very tight and little around it. Right? What we see in practice often, you know, we put the here's maximum and then we have you know, like this where we have high rate of evolution or a high sigma or actually low sigma.
and like that, where I could have you know high sigma and low alpha, or high al uh, alpha and low sigma, yeah, equal likelihood. Okay, and so you have this, this almost a ridge in likelihood. If were a complete ridge. As a contract map, then you're out of luck. You can move anywhere along this point. That's the right way. You know, that's one line. It's not quite that bad, but it's not great. Okay. And finally, um, we worked on a method that allows you to vary all of these. Okay. We can do that now, too. So, how does that get this one? This, this, oh, this one? Yeah. Oh. Um, there we don't like to be nuts and say you only have, well, you could, actually, if you could be nuts, so you could have, these, maybe it probably goes up to 10, or here you have, like, you know, thousands of parameters. But you're right, this is basically this model. Okay. But people do sometimes try to go nuts. So, you know, we're joking about people trying to fit, you know, have five data points and try to fit in 12 parameters. Maybe people who are trying to fit... They had three apes. They had like humans, ape, humans, chimps, and gorilla. So three taxa. I'm trying to fit a different OU model on every branch. So they had four branches, each with three parameters, for three taxa, for one trait. It's not working well. Yes, that's, that's good. Right? It shouldn't be working well. Um, <coughs> so you can get still in trouble with this. Okay. Um, So I can use some practice. Well, one example here, we have um, wing length. Let me just put such a wing length here. Right. Well, you can do you can just use this function, right? And you know, plug and chug and try you know, different values here with the equation and see which ones maximize the right. So we can use the equation for the entire tree to get it with a special state for these two. And we see, even though the mean of these two be somewhere right here, we can put an interest system over here. Why is that? So the Barney motions, this has like just yeah, one, one sigma, no theta, and zero alpha. Well, this is actually this is a reconstruction. So this is saying the likelihood is maximized by this value. So let's try to just find the likelihood value for this given the entire tree. Right? So if you put it over here, right, and make these more likely, then it means have a lot of change happening compared to here. Right? And it's less likely. We put it over here in the middle, and we're going to go out this way. <coughs> right, so trying to get the optimal value through the entire tree, but right, it's giving the same tax. So. Okay. So put the point here on the like, words and the y-axis. Right. That's based on the time. You have like a chronogram. And so it can do this, this basic multivariate normal equation, right? And use this for looking at rates of evolution, rates faster or slower. We uh, look for you know, different rates. We try looking at different attraction parameters. We try looking at doing such a state estimation and even more. Okay, so again, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a normal distribution. A multivariate normal distribution, that's it, right? Even so, we can use it with many, many different processes to get up these questions. Okay, you know, basic simple model. Alright, let's take a break and then come back in five minutes and talk about correlation.